Okay. So I'm standing here once again in the wonderful, beautiful Air Lindhurst Hall where some of the world's finest film scores are recorded. This is the first time I've ever seen my entire drum collection set up all in one place. And the brief to, to John and the team here was that we would set up as if we were setting up the largest drum ensemble pretty much ever put together for a film soundtrack and leaving it set up for the, for the whole time. So we would have the same stereo imagery, 5.1 imagery, whatever, um, for the whole period of time. Of course, the strings and brass would be in another room because there's no room for them. But uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful setup. And the way they're, they're spaced out means the whole room kind of goes up in flames with sound the minute they're all getting hit. Okay, this is probably pride of place, right in the center of our sound field, center of the studio, center of all our attentions. This is from Northern Thailand, and it's called a Klong Sabat Chai, which loosely translates as a victory drum. It has two purposes. It has another name for the other purpose, which is a Klong Pusha. Okay, the first purpose is soldiers use it to do acrobatic dances before going into war to show off to each other how fit and agile they are, at which point this drum is slung vertically and they jump at it, they play it with their feet and their knees and their legs, their hand, even their head. And, you know, it, it's a, a kind of big drum party, really. So that's the its purpose as a klong sabat chai, which is kind of fun. Its other version, the klong pusha, that's when it's in a temple. Uh, that means the worshipping drum. At that point, it's played a lot more quietly, as you can imagine. So in the temple, it would be played, it's almost like the ultimate boomer drum. You mic this up closely and it's got fantastic low end and fantastic sustain as well. But unlike so many other, let's call it bass drums, um, you can really hit this thing hard. I'm not sure whether this one is buffalo skin or the skin of a bull, but either way, it's been blessed by the monks before it came out into the world. And um, we had this stand made in, to enable the drum to be played horizontally. So it's the heart of this collection. I'm just going to hit a couple of notes um, to show you the, the sort of oomph you can get out of it. And that's in contrast to this amazing gong-like sound that you get from it too. Very versatile. This drum here, I guess, it is, it's the other sort of main event of our collection here. So this, this one here is the oldest drum we have, and uh, it's almost certainly from West Africa, probably Burundi. It is around 150 years old. And I can tell you that the head of this drum is the same one that it would have had on 150 years ago in the late 1800s. So this, this is really special. It's made from a single, very large branch or, or possibly, you know, a suitable part of the trunk of the tree, but it's, it's, it's the full circumference. And it's even got a, a tripod base, which is carved out of the tree. It looks kind of rough hewn, if I may put it that way, but actually, I can actually feel the air moving as it comes out of the bottom of the drum. It's, bit like a jet engine really. It, it's got that amazing ventilation. But this works incredibly well played with the hands, very well with hard sticks and soft sticks and uh, needs occasional heater on it just to, to get the pitch exactly as we would want to have it. Okay, in our collection here today where we have 53 drums in this room, in this wonderful Air Lindhurst Hall room, this is one of three sets of 
what are known as junjuns or dunduns or even just dununs. We've got three sets of them. This uh, is the nicest set. It's from Mali and they're hand carved and they're all hairy, which gives them a lovely diffuse sound. We have this one tuned to a fundamental and this one is an octave. This is the tenth or a third above the octave. Now, we're playing these with hard sticks, soft sticks, and they sound wonderful with hands. Often, when these are, these are played in Africa, they're suspended on their sides, sometimes round the neck, which means they'd be very strong if they were holding this one round their neck because they're made from hardwood and they're, they're, they're very, very heavy. And they can be played with sticks at both ends and they always have a bell attached to them, uh, which is, it sounds like a bit like a light, ringy cowbell. And it's part of the drummer's job to sort of alternate between hitting the drum and, and, and playing the bell. They'll be used in sets of three, sometimes three different players playing the three drums, sometimes just one player playing all three. And it will nearly always be a djembe sort of improvising away on top. But we have three sets of juns, jun juns, dun duns, dununs here. And they, they form part and parcel of the larger drum ensembles, but they also make for good solo instruments and also good drums in their sort of African context. Okay, these three beauties are from Thailand. They're called klong. Klong means drum in, in Thai language. Uh, klong tat is just the name of this drum. It doesn't mean anything in particular. These again have multi-uses. They're used as fairly gentle accompaniment to, to very stylized Thai dancing and to the same extent for puppetry shows, you know, those shadow puppets. Um, also, they're used outdoors, particularly for Chinese New Year and celebrations like that, which are also keenly celebrated in Thailand. They the pitches are somewhat random, but they can be induced to, as we have here, a higher, medium and a low. Okay, they sound great played with the hands, although that's not the traditional way of playing them. They, they can be gently struck with mallets, very woody sound, or you can they become a really integral part of a taiko ensemble because they're your mid-range and the, the, the high end of a taiko ensemble. They're not Japanese, they're not actually taikos, but they are barrel drums exactly like taikos and they work really well in an ensemble like that. No collection of this kind would be complete without a taiko, a Nagado taiko. And we have this one here which is tunable and very versatile. We've um, taken some of the ring out of the head by putting this little bit of putty here. You'll see that on some of the drums. A lot of these drums we've worked on to make sure their ring times are very compatible with each other and there are no buzzes or unwanted side effects, if you like. This is great. We've, we've combined this instrument with other instruments that are, shall we say, thick-skinned with very heavy heads, so you can play them very hard with these batchy sticks. does wonderful things in this room. Okay, this is probably 1920s band bass drum. We've essentially converted it into a tom-tom. We call them all basso toms for the, in, in our parlance for this project. This is with, again, original uh, cowhide drum heads. It, it works effectively as a bass drum. I mean, really effectively as a bass drum, whichever side of it we use, but when we're making the big tom ensembles, this is really the low end of that. And of course, we can, we can belt it. And we also uh, get over the potential problem of the bigger drums ringing out a lot longer than some of the smaller drums. We make a, a, a small mute for the drums using circles of paper which when you hit it, 
the main body of the sound disappears quite quickly, much more in tune with some of the smaller drums we have. Not only that, you get a little cutting edge as you attack the drum, which also gives you the kind of sound that gives you loads of heft, but it also cuts through big orchestral textures, which is what you want. I mean, for me, it's lovely to be standing here in this room where most of the great film soundtracks are made, trying all these drums out and thinking, okay, where's the best place to put this? What's the best stick to hit it with? What's its best dynamic range? But this room tells you everything you need to know about that almost immediately. Outside this room, these drums all sound really great. I promise you that. But bring them in here and they multiply two or three times in, in size, in aura, dimension, everything about them becomes bigger. And when you get five or six of these drums playing at once, the effect is awesome, which is not a word I use very often. Okay, while we're on the subject of the Tom ensembles, for the want of a, a better word, uh, this is a Brazilian Alfaia drum. This is incredibly versatile. This, this is a 22-inch Alfaia. It has a goat skin head, which is thicker than a rather refined calf skin head, and it can take a lot of hitting, a lot of power. It would also make a really good kit drum because it's got a very rich sound. You've got all that organic quality of the goatskin head, and yet you can hit it really hard without any danger to the head at all. So we've got two of these, and this can also be muted. Which gets the sound away a lot quicker and gives us that slightly snary buzz to the start of the sound, which we like a lot. Also integral to the Tom Ensemble, we've decided to use a Chinese Tangu drum, uh, which is one of these slightly compressed barrel drums, in the sense that it, it has a very good sound envelope. It also has some very bright high end and really good attack. So it, it's very compatible with all the others, uh, despite it being unique uh, in terms of where it comes from and how it's normally played, it works really well in this setup. Okay, some other examples of members of our Megatom Ensemble. This is a 1920s, probably jazz drum kit, bass drum, made by John Gray and company. Uh, we've got a, a mute on this one. So this is giving that cutting edge of the Tom Tom Ensemble. We also have this one, which is a 1960s Japanese 20 inch bass drum made by Suzuki actually, but we've put a goatskin head on this one, damped it a little bit. Got a lot of power, but some cutting edge. We also have this 1930s Beverly bass drum. And these two quite aged bass drums. This one is a marching drum, actually quite a lot lighter than the others. It's got some good attack. And this one, I think, possibly was a large drum kit bass drum. This one has just got the one head, which means it's much more pitched than the others. And a good ring out, but really good focus, really good attack, really good power. You get lower before it gets higher. Going up. Talking about a rugby team, these would be the forwards. 
Okay, these are the higher pitched drums, uh, they're long drums. Uh, this, I'm almost certain, is West African. I suspect it's from Guinea. And it's not only a very rich and organic sounding drum, it is most beautifully carved along the entire length of it. And it's a fantastic work of art, both to look at and to, to listen to. The next drum, it's been in my collection for about 40 years. And I've really looked forward to committing it to a sample collection. Uh, this is almost certainly from Senegal or anywhere in West Africa where they grow the baobab tree because this is actually the short branch of a baobab tree that's been hollowed out. So this hasn't been carved. This is the way that it grew. It's actually quite a soft wood. Like the baobab tree is like a giant cactus. So this is what in, in vegetable terms they call a succulent. So you, you feel that once upon a time this was holding a lot of water. But it's, it's now a beautiful drum and has been for a very long time. Very suitable for close miking. You can get a lot of different sounds out of it and uh, it's a lovely drum. So we're going to something a lot more recent now and a lot more modern in its conception. This is a modern version of an Ngoma drum, a West African Ngoma drum. It's a little bit like a turbocharged djembe in this very highly tuned head, but it has this really deep resonating chamber underneath. And you can actually hear the bass end bouncing off the floor and coming back at you. You can hear the head bouncing off the roof of this wonderful church and coming back at you. So when you've got all these big drums going, you think, well, what on earth can compete with that? What can actually still be heard cutting through that rolling thunder of all these drums? And it's these. We have two of these, so we get a really nice stereo version of that. Okay, talking of high cutting edge drums, this is front and center. This is a Thai goblet drum, otherwise known as a klong yao, meaning long drum. This is like a exponential speaker horn sticking out of the bottom of the instrument. And again, you can hear the sound bouncing off the floor. Doesn't have that metallic edge that the Ngomas have. but it's still a really good treble for this big choir of tenor and baritone and bass drums that we have all over this room. So here's our second Ngoma drum. You're getting that bass. It's really good. These drums, they have probably 100 year old heads on them that are very, very thick, which is how they're still on the drum after a hundred years. They've got a little sort of mysterious pitch to them and that they work much better played very quietly. Also, although you can, you know, belt them quite hard as part of an ensemble. But for me, I just feel the character and the hundred years of this drum. Again, West African, not sure of the country of origin. It could be Nigeria. And finally, this one is definitely from Burundi. It's like a slightly smaller version of the classic Burundi drummers, cylinder drums. Again, when you play it, it just speaks to you of age and culture. It's not going to be the drums you use in a drum line that can compete with four trombones, a tuba, and eight French horns, but it's just reeking of history.
and the culture from whence it came. In this collection, we have high, medium, and low, but the big connecting point is that they all have animal skin, hide skin, no plastic heads here, and so they have a wonderfully homogenous blend of sound. I'm only doing this once, and this is the only place I was ever going to do it. <laughs>